If you had to choose a spiritual song uh, to praise uh, Christ for saving you, which one would you pick? If you had to pick a song, why don't you, why don't you tell me? I'll let you talk. Redeemed? No, oh, you can't talk all at one time, so. <laughs> Just raise your hand and I'll point to you. So redeemed. I mean, you have to raise your hand. <laughs> Mr. Watina. Amazing Grace, okay. Who else? Yeah. Rugged Cross. Rugged Cross. I think it's the old Rugged Cross. That one? That one? Yeah, that's one of my favorites too. What else would you pick? Song, song to praise God for redeeming you. That's it? What would you say? George, did you raise your hand? <laughs> He's even on the older board. They just kind of do their own thing. What did you say, George? Beneath the, Beneath the cross of Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. Pardon? Oh, I, it's hard for me to see back there. Yes. I love to tell the story of things, unseen things above, correct? Yes. What is it? That came kind of from the heavenly sphere, I think. That's way up there. Yeah. Okay, so if you had to pick a song, think about it. Like, what would I pick? Uh, and what would I, what would I sing? Uh, and like when, you're, like when I'm studying or uh, doing different things, I always have like different YouTube channels on, listening to different things. Uh, and so there's different songs that I, would, that I like to listen to. I like the Gaithers. I know I'm dating myself, but... Uh, but there's, there's songs, there's choruses that I like. Uh, I like uh, when I'm playing the piano. Some of them I praise God when I play the piano. So I like to uh, play, uh, I could sing of your love forever. I love that one. Um, your grace still amazes me. Uh, I've been saved since 1967. It still amazes me that he saved me. Um, grace flows down. I love that old chorus. Hymns, uh, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. I love that one. Um, I've always liked wonderful grace of Jesus. Uh, great, great old song. Uh, modern music. Uh, I really like uh, "Graves to Gardens" and "Graves into Gardens" by Elevation Church. Uh, Chris Tomlin's uh, "Is He Worthy" is just an anointed song because he is worthy of praise and adoration. So I submit to you. Uh, I, I, I gave you assignments the last two Sundays. Yeah, that's probably why we have fewer people today, huh? Is, <laughs> I'm not showing up there again. Uh, yeah. Uh, so did you do your acrostic? I've, been, I've received many of your acrostics. Uh, did, you, did you do one? So you've had two weeks to work on the different um, uh, particular psalmic structures for your own worship of the Lord. But when we look at Israel, uh, their praise of God, uh, what songs would they pick? So if you were to ask an ancient Jew, what songs would you pick uh, that were your great tributes to God's redemption? They, they would have collectively told you Psalms 113 to 118. Those would have been the psalms they picked. Those are known uh, as the Egyptian songs, especially uh, 113 and 14. Egyptian songs in the sense that they recount the story of the redemption from, ex from the, the exodus from uh, Egypt. And so these particular songs uh, were Passover songs. And so they would sing uh, Psalm 113 and 114 uh, for Passover before they ate the meal. And it was about a two-hour process for a typical Passover service. So when they began the entire Passover uh, observation of remembering how when they applied the blood of the slain animal, the, the lamb to the doorpost of their home, the death angel would see the blood and then pass over. And that's, you know, eventually, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, uh, Paul's going to come along and say later, Jesus is your Passover lamb. So basically, there's only two kinds of people in the world. The, the blood of Christ is painted on the doorpost of your, of your life, and the death angel passes over because you have the life of Christ, uh, and you're forgiven, or he doesn't. And he comes to your house, and you have spiritual death about you. You're either spiritually dead or spiritually alive. Passover uh, was that time when the, uh, the Israelites would uh, sing praises to God who had redeemed them. Psalm 113 uh, was the first one they would sing. Now, I don't know the musical notes uh, to what they did. We just have the words. And so what we're going to do is, is, is look at how they, how they praised God historically for ideas of then how we should praise God. And when you look at this psalm, you're going to, two motifs are going to present themselves. Uh, they're going to praise God, uh, number one, for his person, and then number two, for his provision. Either they're going to praise God for his person, his character, and then they're going to praise God for his provision, because his person leads him to do things for us, to provide for us. And so when you look at this text, if you wanted to construct an, an idea, uh, is there is a command in this particular text 
uh, in verse 1 and in verse 9 uh, to praise God for these two things. Praise Him for His person, who He is, His character, and then you praise Him for His provision. So you should spend time uh, praising God who has redeemed you uh, and spending time talking about that redemption based on the character of God, that he's merciful, long-suffering, patient, kind, gracious, etc. You can focus any one of your praise prayers just on one concept. So when we look at this particular text, uh, we're going to move down through those points of how did they praise God when it came to Passover, and they remembered that God redeemed them. So we're going to look at these two things. I know it's not a three-part sermon. You're going to probably hyperventilate uh, if you're going to Dallas Seminary, taking classes on sermonic, sermonic preparation. I'm just here to tell you, sometimes sermons are not three points. Can you handle this? Yes. Thank the Lord that you're not like the pastor when Liz and I were checking churches out at Dallas back in 1981. The guy closed with 16 points after a 30-minute sermon. I'm not doing that. This is just two. What are we doing? We're learning how to praise God for his what? Person and his provision. So let's look at number one. Praise God for his person based on this uh, ancient song, thanking God for redeeming them from the pa uh, during the Passover. So verse one, what does he say? He says, praise the Lord, exclamation point. Praise, uh, praise the Lord, O you servants of the Lord. Praise the, the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forever. From the rising of the sun and to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So the Reader's Digest will probably have a problem with how many times the word praise was used in those texts. It's so verbose. Uh, no, it's anointed. It's an inspired. What does God say? Uh, make sure that you praise me. And now these are all commands in, in Greek, in fact, or in Hebrew. In fact, I will I'll tell you the very first verse has three commands of praising God. Three. That's like, wow, Holy Spirit, Jesus, and then God the Father have just told you praise is so important. And then it ends in verse, if you skip down to verse 9, um, where it closes by saying praise the Lord, uh, that is called as just a rhetorical device. It's called inclusio, I-N-C-L-U-S-I-O, inclusio. So inclusio means you, you start uh, and finish similarly. What's that about? It's like, it's like a beautiful bow wrapped around what he's saying. And he also wants to make sh sure that as you age, you will not forget what you're supposed to do, <laughs> which is what? Praise the Lord. So he's told you three times in verse one, he finishes in verse nine with an exclamation of praise the Lord, hallelujah. And so that's what we want to focus on is what these commands are not suggestions. And so you need to ask yourself as a sidelight, what does a, a life of praise look like? I mean, what does it look like? In my life, what does a life of praise look like? Um, it probably denotes that if you look at your life in a given day, uh, in a given week, you spend much of your time talking to God, not, about, not asking Him for things, but praising Him for things of who He is. That, that's a mature prayer. Uh, and so you stop and ask yourself, how long do I focus on the character of God? Uh, when we look at this and move down through the verses, uh, you're going to find in verses 1 to 6, if you look at verses 1 to 6 where he talks about God's uh, person, uh, then that only leaves verses 7, 8, and 9, only three verses to talk about what he does, which tells you when you're praising God, uh, the emphasis upon is person. Secondary is what he's done for me. It's typically we flip this around. What does he do for me? And then I'll think about his person. No, the psalmist says, let's move down and think about the greatness of God. So he's going to focus on the character of God, starting uh, in... in um, uh, verse 2. Blessed is the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. So I want to focus on the concept that throughout this particular uh, section, verses uh, 1 to 6, and you could also include verse 9, uh, he's going to use the name L-O-R-D capitalized, and he's going to use it seven times. I get paid to count stuff. Seven times does he use L-O-R-D throughout this text. Uh, what this tells you is he's focusing upon the great name of God. This is the main name of God, not, not tied to a work of God, like God the healer or God the Lord of hosts. No, this is just the Lord. So when he it, it focuses his praises, it's upon the, the eternal one. This is the name that uh, Moses was given uh, by the Lord when Moses asked him at the burning bush, I need a name. Your people are going to want a name. And God gives him a name. And so he tells him, I'm going to read it to you in Hebrew, and you can hear what it sounds like, okay? You ready? So he asks him, what is your name? And, and God's going to, I'm going to tell you. So and God uh, says to him, Elohim says to him, uh, to Moses, I, I am that I am. 
Sounds like this. Ve'yormo Elohim el Moshe, to Moses, he speaks. Ichye Esher Ichye. That's what it sounds like. It just gives me the chills. When God speaks in human history what his name is, this is it. He says, my name is I am that I am. It's a verb. We've talked about this many times. You can never talk about it enough because God's telling you, I am the ontologically always existent one. I am always there. So if God is the one who is always there, then in my life, if I have highs and lows of my life, God can speak that in all of those, I am there. I will never leave you or desert you, as Jesus has said. Uh, this is God of the Old Testament. Uh, he was uh, existent in um, times past. He's existent in the present, and he's, in, he's existent in the future. Um, but there, there is debate and, uh, about God's existence, uh, and some of you are of one camp. I'm of the other camp, and I pray for those in the other camp. But we have these debates and these philosophical discussions uh, uh, about God and how God exists, and there are some in our church that believe that time is eternal. And I can respect that. I've heard all of your arguments uh, for that, and, and I can respect those arguments. I'm still not convinced that time is eternal because of, well, I am that I am, to me, suggests eternal existence outside of time and space. But one thing that I do find when you praise God for his person is in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, we read this. It says, he has saved us and called us to a holy life, Jesus, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and his grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus when, well, before the, what? Beginning of time. That's an interesting phrase. Uh, in Greek, uh, when you read that in Greek, um, that's, that, that's what it looks like. Um, the, the last clause down at the bottom there, uh, I don't have my clicker. I was going to bring a clicker. Okay, so you see the last word on the, on the clause? Yeah, that last word is, is eternity. But the word before it, I'll just say it to you. Chronon. That's the word for time. What's it sound like? Chronology. So he says that we've got this grace uh, this, that's been given to us uh, from, from God himself, from Jesus himself, uh, and it was given to us uh, before the beginning of chron chronos, chronological time. Well, we all understand what chronological time is, it not? He just told you that chron chronological time as we know it, uh, built upon causation, cause and effect that creates time, there was a time when it was not. And so, you know, for those over the other camp, I can respect your viewpoint, and some are of that viewpoint. Uh, but my point at the end of the day is time will tell when we stand before God's presence and we'll be seeing the great eternal one. And one of us can say, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> but will it really matter? No. These are just things that a super type A church talks about. <laughs> and you're sitting there wondering, what is Marty talking about? Well, well God's the eternally existent one. So he's, he's the great I am. So what does this mean? Well, he always was, he always is, and he always will be. Uh, and he's called the first and the last. He's called the Alpha and the Omega. And he's called both of those things in both Testaments. In fact, in Isaiah 41, verse 4, 48, verse 12, uh, he calls himself the first and the last. Um, then Jesus comes along in Revelation 1, 17, chapter 2, verse 8, and 22, 13. And he says, well, I am the first and the last. So to the family members that are on my mom's side of the family, they're Jehovah's Witnesses, who do not believe that Jesus is Jehovah God, uh, they must reconsider. Because what did Jesus just say about himself? He says, I'm the great I am. I'm the first and the last. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. He just identified himself with Jehovah God. Why? He is. He is God. So he is great. He's the eternal one. He, he stepped into time and space that he created, uh, and the goal was to bring salvation to his people. That's exactly what he did. Uh, and when you look through the Old Testament, the name L-O-R-D capitalized means Yahweh or uh, the great I am. Um, when you look at his great name, you have to ask yourself, uh, what are, how is that name used throughout the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, and the prophets specifically? And so what I did is I just did a tour of how that word is used. Uh, what you will find in Genesis 3, verse 21, after Adam and Eve sinned, notice which name of God is used. And the Lord, Yahweh, uh, God made, El that's Elohim, uh, the creator God, uh, made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Now, the supposition is they had sinned, correct? They had eaten of the forbidden tree, uh, and they had sinned. They brought sin into the world. So man's problem is sin. 
Uh, but who provided the first covering for sin by blood sacrifice? God. And how do we know there was blood sacrifice? Well, those garments of skin didn't come from just anywhere. See, scholars theorize that, that God was the first one to kill the sacrificial animal to provide clothing to cover them because now they understood uh, their nakedness because of their sin. So who did this? L-O-R-D did it. The eternal one did that because he's redemptive. Remember, he's the God of the Passover is what he is. Uh, when you look in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, verse 5, and verse 16 about the Noahic flood, uh, you'll find that it was the Lord, L-O-R-D, the eternal one, uh, that stepped into time and space and told old man Noah, who lived in the middle of nowhere, uh, to build a ship. But it had never rained. But he says, build a boat, because it's going to rain. Who was the one that delivered uh, Ab uh, Noah and his, his wife and his sons and daughters? Who delivered them? Well, it was the great eternal one, stepped into time and space. He's the redeemer. Um, when, you, when you think about... Um, Leviticus uh, chapters 1 to 7. Uh, I took a Hebrew exegetical class my senior year at Dallas. It was awesome. Uh, Leviticus is an amazing book. But the first seven chapters of Leviticus, uh, I went through and counted it this week. How many times does the name God, the Creator, Elohim, occur in, in the Levitical sacrifices? 1 to 7 of Leviticus. Remember, it's all about redemption. You have to have blood sacrifice to have your sin covered. Elohim occurs two times in all of those texts. How many times does L-O-R-D capitalized occur? Um, again, I told you I get paid to count stuff, right? 80 times. 80 as opposed to two. What's he telling you? Well, the great creator God made us. We were put in a garden and we sinned. And then who is the one, what name is used to describe how great his redemption is? Yahweh, the eternal one, who, who could have said, I am too busy to help you but he left his position to come down to us to redeem us. You, you understand why he says, praise this Lord, why he says it so many times, seven times the number of God, perfection. He says, when you think about God, think of the great eternal one uh, who uh, provided redemption through sacrifice as denoted in the book of Leviticus. And then Jesus is gonna become the one who fulfills the entire Levitical system of sacrifice. He is the burnt offering. He is the meal offering. He is the peace offering. He is the sin offering. He's all of those things, which makes you as a non-Christian, you should be stopping and ask yourself, is he my sacrifice? Is he my sacrifice? Because remember your doorpost either has the blood of Christ painted on there by faith or not. So he's the one who stepped into time and space to heal us. Uh, it says in Psalm 113 verse two, that we should bless him. We should bless him from the rising of the sun to its setting. Or uh, we could take that figure of speech and just say, when you praise God, the great eternal one, uh, according to that particular phrase, you should praise him over the entire face of the earth. So if you live in Singapore, you should praise God. If you live in New York, you should praise God. If you're suffering for God in Hawaii, you should still get up in the morning and walk out to the beach and do what? Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. It's wherever it's Sinners that become saints should be moved to praise God who has redeemed them. In verses 4 to 5, he says this. He says, the Lord, in addition to being the great eternal one, he tells you where he lives and what he's like. It says, the Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is enthroned on high? who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and on earth. Let's, let's look at this. At first, he tells you, in addition to God being the great eternal one, uh, he is uh, high above all the nations. Uh, the, the word for high appears first in the text. It's a participle in the Hebrew text, and it's the word ram. And ram uh, denotes uh, superiority. And because it is a par participle, you can classify it as a of participle, meaning he never stops being in that position. See, we have presidents come and go, don't we? They come, they go. They think they have all power and authority, and then they get voted out, and there's another one that comes in, and, and then they change the whole cabinet, and everybody loses their job. Happened to you? You know, and you got a whole bunch of other people. They come and go. But when you think about God, why should he be praised? He is always high and lifted up. He's always. There's never a time when he's not on his throne. And I don't know, if you think about this pragmatically, it should be, be uh, of great comfort to you because he who is high and lifted up uh, is, is always concerned about what's going on with your life. He's, he always condescends himself to your level. It says in Isaiah 40, verse uh, 15, I love this about God. Behold, the nations, the goyim, the Gentiles, uh, what are they to God? <laughs> Plink. I was going to have a bucket up here with some water, but I'm sure you're smart enough to get the point, right? 
all of the nations and all of their power and all of their wealth and all of their everything, it's just to God, it's like, plink, drop in the bucket, plink. They're dropping the bucket, and they're counted as small dust in a balance. The old, he takes up the aisles as very little. I mean, islands to him are nothing. I mean, he made all of these things. So when you think of God as being high and lifted up, uh, compare that against the nations that think they're all that in a proverbial bag of chips. They think they are all that, don't they? Don't they? Uh, arrogance drips from them, and when they think they have all power, and God looks down from on high and says, oh, no. No, you're, you're just there for a moment. I am the true Lord, the true sovereign one. And so I, I get great uh, peace uh, for myself as I live in a world of broken people uh, who happen to be in places of positions of power, and it comes and goes. And I've seen many political systems so far in my lifetime. I think the first one I remember is Kennedy uh, when I was a kid. Um, but I've seen all kinds of turmoil all of my life. But through that, I have the assurance that God is always what? He's always high. He's high and lifted up. In addition to that, it says in verse 4, uh, the second clause is, His glory is above the heavens. Uh, I don't know. You probably don't like prepositional phrases. I do, so come with me. Are you going to come with me? So what does it say? Uh, His glory is above the heavens. So he's telling you uh, where he's located. Uh, so in, in Jewish terminology, the different heavens would be the sky in which we see, outer space, and then God's domain. Uh, So this is amazing. So he's telling you his glory, uh, his kavod, his brilliance that shines forth from his holiness is located where? Well, it's above the heavens as we see them, the the stars of which we we see. So so let's think about it pragmatically for a moment about where God is. And then we'll come from where he is to, well, what that means to us. Think about the greatness of God. So if you measured between the earth and the edge of the known universe that is expanding, um, how big is that? Uh, well, they say, from what I, and there's lots of debate online, but from what I could land on, and I do have to preach on Sunday, so I can't continue to read articles where they debate. So what I did is I landed on what scientists said, is they said it is 46 billion light years away, the edge of the universe. And, you know, light traveling, you know, 186,000 miles per second. It would, it would take 46 billion years to get there. Would anyone survive in an aircraft, any kind of spacecraft? No. You could fly 14,000 miles an hour and still not get there. So uh, what I did is is I looked at uh, one particular website which said, to traverse the entire massive universe in a conventional spacecraft would take 225 trillion years. (laughs) You, You can't even compute that. And when it says God, His glory is above the heavens, it's telling you He's above the edge of the existing cosmos that's mind-boggling. Um, no, we couldn't load people into an, uh, any kind of spacecraft. Even if they flew at the speed of life, it would still take them 93 billion years to get there. No one would make it, right? Now think about this. It says that's where his glory is. That's where his glory is. So the stars, the sun, and all the things that are in the cosmos are merely a faint reflection of the glory of God. And that glory of God, uh, he's going to allow us to see it. And in fact, there's been times in history where he's come from his dimensionality uh, outside the cosmos into our dimensionality to show us his glory, his brilliance. Uh, Isaiah 60 is a promise that one day when he comes in his glory, Christ, uh, and reigns and rules from Jerusalem, we'll see his glory on a daily basis. Notice what it says. Violence will not be heard again in your land when the Messiah comes nor devastation or destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor brightness will the moon give you light. What will you have? It says, but you will have the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, the great eternal one, for an everlasting light and and God for your glory. Your sun will uh, set no more, neither will your moon wane, for you will have the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, the great eternal one, for an everlasting light and the days of your morning will be finished. He says, one day, the Messiah comes. Who is he? He's the everlasting God. And when he rules and reigns from Jerusalem, when he's there, when he's here, when he comes back, you won't need the sun. Why? (laughs) He's brighter than the sun. Now, I don't know if you can tan. (laughs) I'm a Californian. I'm just saying, but it's going to be so bright. It's going to be blinding light, and it's going to be emanating from Jerusalem all around the planet, and there will be no problem. You won't need the moon, correct? Because you'll have Jesus there. Now, I find this most interesting. He, 
who is eternal, the capital L-O-R-D, uh, whom, according to uh, Solomon in 1 Kings 8, 27, he says the heavens cannot contain you. Uh, he is transcendent, living on, beyond our dimensionality in the massive nature of the cosmos. He's transcendent, but he's oh so imminent. Don't you find this paradox totally amazing? Um, it says in verse 6 of Psalm 116, uh, he says, who humbles himself to behold the things that are on heaven and in earth. And it ends in a question mark. It's basically saying, what kind of God that is that great takes the time to humble himself to get to know us? This is unbelievable. He who is existing in a place of great glory and in, in the praise of the angels and, and the saints, he's transcendent, yet he takes time with your life. So I'll ask you a simple question. Does he care about you? Yeah. Think about it. Does he care about you? Yes. He controls the entire cos cosmos, the massive mechanizations to op operate the cosmos. He could say to you, if you said you wanted to talk to him, talk, take it up with an angel, put your name on the list. I might get back to you. I'm super busy. He could tell you this. Does he? No. He says in Hebrews 4, come boldly before my throne of grace. Come, come speak with me. Uh, when I was on uh, Vice President Pence's uh, uh, list to pray for his staff twice a week if I wanted to. All I had to do was call, uh, and I would go down on a subway, and I would pray for his staff in his office. And I did it a number of times over the four years that he was vice president. Do you think I ever saw him? How many think I actually saw the vice president? You'd be wrong. I never saw him. Uh, every time I would show up, he's not there. His staff were there. I'd pray with his staff, and then I would leave, uh, one time he was going to show up. I was so excited. There was about seven or eight of us, and he was going to show up. He had the he had the uh, the, uh, the uh, secret service agents out in the hallway, uh, and I was so excited when I went in. It was like he's going to be here today. And then some something happened. Some national thing happened. Military thing happened, and 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 he got called away because a news team showed up, and he he got called away. And I'm like, I missed him. I mean, I wanted to see him. Don't you find it interesting? I never saw the vice president. But I can go to the God of the cosmos at any time. And he's like, hey, Marty, good to see you. What's going on in your life? This is mind-boggling. He's transcendent, yet he's absolutely perpetually imminent. So why in the world would you not praise that God, the one who always is, no matter what your issues are, he's there for you? So think about his person, how great it is. When you praise him, think about his person. Secondly, think about his provision in your life. Your provision. Well, what does he do for you? He's going to give you uh, two illustrations of God's provision. Uh, number one, it says in verse seven, he praises, he raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. So God is great. He just talked about in the first six verses. He's transcendent, yet he's, he's imminent. So in his imminency, what does he do? Well, he takes time to care for, well, the less fortunate. So does, is God concerned about your financial issues? Yeah. If, if you don't have enough, is he concerned? Absolutely. See, he, this is on his heart. It's all through the Torah. It's all through the prophets that God is concerned about the poor. Uh, he talks about it in Deuteronomy 14, 28, and 29. He talks about it in Deuteronomy 16, 10 to 15, chapter 24, 19 to 21, Isaiah 1, 16 and 17, and on and on through the scriptures it goes in the Old Testament. He's concerned about people with, who are unfortunate financial situations, the poor. So much so that in chapter 24 of the book of Deuteronomy, notice what he says to his people. He says, uh, you know, when you get into the land of promise and you reap your harvest in your field, you're a farmer, and you, uh, you forgot a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back and get it. Hey, but that's worth five bucks or five shekels or whatever. No, he says, no, you need to leave that for who? The alien, the stranger, uh, for the orphan and for the widow, in order that the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, the eternal one, your God, Elohim, the creator, may bless you in all the work of your hands. Translated, if you don't do that, he probably won't bless you. Verse 20, and when you beat your olive tree, you shall not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow. So if you hold a bunch of olive trees and they're laden with olives and you're shaking the tree to get all the olives off, whatever's left on there, you cannot go back. Who's it for? Anybody that's less fortunate. Think about, uh, there was a young lady from uh, the country of Moab. Her name Ruth, not a Jew. She's a Gentile. She's a Goy. She's not even, a, she's not even part of the Torah. 
And, and, and God says, even for that person, she's, she's an alien, she's a stranger, you are to care for her. Well, she became a, a recipient in those four chapters of the book of Ruth of the, the love of God for someone who was less fortunate. Because we know that she got married uh, to uh, a, a son who died as a young man. Uh, in fact, two girls uh, married uh, two Jewish boys of the same family, and both young men died. Uh, and so, you know, have you read the book? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, eventually one, one of them stayed in Moab, and the other young lady, Ruth, traveled uh, with Naomi back to the Bethlehem area uh, to be there because she loved her mother-in-law dearly, wanted to be near her. And you know the story. Uh, because she eventually went to go glean in the field of a young man named Boaz. He just happened to be a family member of Naomi, who was the goel or the kinsman redeemer, meaning he had the right to, to marry the, the widow of Naomi. Do you think she was in his field by accident? Do you think the transcendent God did not know her situation? Do you think God did not know when, when Boaz came riding by in his horse one day uh, that he was riding by? Do you, do you think God did not know when Boaz first saw Ruth out in the field? Who's that? If you're married, when you fell in love, remember the first time you saw her, men? Remember? When you saw, I'm talking about your wife. <laughs> you're sitting there so quiet. Remember when you first saw her and you're thinking, whoa. Did you have this feeling? Or was it just like, oh, she's okay. No, when you first saw her, didn't you just like, I mean, I'm consumed. Uh, Boaz, don't you think God knows about that? Sure. He, God was there when Boaz saw her. Uh, and then when she eventually marries Boaz, uh, God totally blesses this goy, this, this Gentile, this poor woman, because God has a heart for the poor. And so he moved in a proud, fa profound fashion. So exactly what it says here in, in, in the Psalm, Psalm 113, 7, that he moved the needy from the ash heap uh, to a place of great blessing. That's exactly what he did to Ruth because she becomes the progenitor of m the Messiah. In fact, her great-great-grandson is going to be David, David, King David. So from this Gentile, God says, I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to save you. I'm going to bless you. And though you're poor, I'm going to bless you greatly. See, this is what God does. He steps into the lives of people with tremendous issues and he says, I might be transcendent, but I'm imminent. And if you're my child, I'm going to come alongside you to assist you. Now, does that mean that God helps every single poor person? No. Because uh, there's reasons why he does what he does uh, and who he helps when he helps. But as you would think in like a wisdom psalm, God's character is to help. Uh, when you think about uh, God helping people and you go to uh, Luke 16, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and they, they both die, and, and, and the rich man goes to hell, and the, and the poor man goes to Abraham's bosom. He had poverty here on earth, but he was spiritually rich. But at the moment of death, he wakes up in glory and sees Abraham, sees God, and he's in heaven, is he not? So you could say that, that God makes sure that all things are fulfilled in his presence, even for the poor. He fulfills the scripture. The, the second thing that God does in his greatness, uh, in verse 9, where he finishes out his... Uh, his little praise of God, he says this, he, the great eternal one, makes the barren woman abide in her house as a joyful mother of children. Therefore, he says, praise the Lord. Uh, he takes a, a woman who could not have children and he blesses her with a child. Does he bless every single barren woman with children? The answer is sadly, no. Uh, both of my sisters uh, could not have children, but I'm going to come back and say something about that in just a minute. But, but there's things way beyond my pay grade to understand why does God do what he does? But sometimes in his greatness, he, he takes his transcendence, moves down to his eminence, and he says, you know what, I'm going to give you a child because it will fulfill my plan. Who comes to mind in the Old Testament? Hannah. Remember Hannah? She begs and pleads with God. I, 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 I want a son. And, she, and God doesn't give it to her. In fact, it says in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 111 that God had closed her womb. It's a providential thing. But she says, God, would you bless me? And we know that God eventually blesses her with a little boy, doesn't he? Boy, did he bless her. What was his name? Samuel. What was he to Israel? Well, he was a judge, a priest, and a prophet before the period of the kings. He was a great man of God, a great Christ type. And she took that little baby, and what did she do with the little baby? Gave it back to the temple. She gave that little baby back to God, and they raised that baby in the temple. 
And so God blessed that one uh, young, barren Jewish woman with a child that became a, a child of all children who blessed the nation. But you have to ask yourself, did he reverse the fortunes of every barren woman in Israel? No. But he chose to, to bless that one, one little woman based on her prayer. Does that mean he didn't care about the other women? No, he cares deeply about them. But he has other plans that he's working out. And we know from uh, this psalm that God cares about our pain, cares about our heartache, but we do know things from him that we have to wrap our mind and heart around when we have an incongruity, when why doesn't he bless every single one? Uh, Isaiah 55, God says to us, my thoughts, they're not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are, well, they're not, they're, they're greater than your thoughts. So think about my sister Marla, uh, who, was, who passed away from ovarian cancer when she was 61. She was the head music teacher for the Spokane School District. She had done that for almost, I don't know, 25 years. When I flew to Spokane for her funeral, and I went to the church, there were hundreds of children there. And she could never have a child. And I, I was super emotional. I almost couldn't even sit on the front row because I could hear all the voices singing around me. And it was children. And what had God done? He had taken this text and said, well, I gave Hannah a child, but Marla, in your situation, I'm going to use you to bless thousands of little children with music. And she did. So at her funeral, they were all there with their posters and everything, with their handprints on them and everything. They all showed up. And to me, that was a praise of God. Because see, God works things differently than what you would anticipate. And she had impacted all of those children for all of those years. And I could only look around and say, well, those were her children. Romans 8 says, For we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. And to that, my sister Marla would have to say, Amen to that. God didn't give me a child, but he gave me children and many families. So God does want to bless you. Be prepared for how God wants to bless you and be prepared to praise him uh, when God blesses you in a profound way. But he who is transcendent is with you and cares about your situation. And all of that means is we should praise him for his person and his provision, be what it may.